to Season 5 of the Hey Girl Podcast with your host and my mom, Bethany Needham. This season, we get to hear from some incredible new guests, and we're bringing back some of our faves. Each guest will share their story of running their race in their place, and we hope they inspire you to do the same. If you want more information or to connect with my mom, go follow our new Instagram at HeyGirlGram, friend us on Facebook at HeyGirlPod, or even better, join our brand new Patreon to get bonus materials, hang with my mom, and you get to help Hey Girl continue to grow and reach more people. That's pretty cool. All right, time to grab that seltzer and maybe a tissue box just in case. Here's my mom. Hey girls, and welcome back to another exciting favorites episode. Once again, I am joined by the beautiful, the wonderful, the amazing, the I want to be here when I grow up, Laura Cassoni. Well, hello. (laughs) Welcome back to the intro. I'm trying a new sound. Did you like that? Hello. I love it. It was better than your Irish accent earlier (laughs) off mic. Another time. Laura, we are once again bringing favorites episodes, ones that we sat down, we're like, what are some that we think are beyond worthy of Mm -hmm. introducing again, making sure that people, A, did not miss them when they were first released, but B, these are worth a re-listen. Like, they're worth the time. And so today is extra special because I'm calling it a double release because I don't actually know if there's a term for it, Mm. but... In light of the fact that we are about to double release Brittany Crosby's episodes, we've had two episodes with her, I thought I should ask you, what is your favorite type of exercise (laughs) ever? Ever? Ever. I have been waiting to say this on air. (gasps) Really? I have no idea. All right, let us have it. Jazzercise. (laughs) Of course it is. There, I just love jazzercise. I love the music. I love the movements. It's so much better than that other one. Zumba. Zumba. Oh. I love jazzercise. Throwing shade at Zumba. And let's just be clear. I'm not throwing out my hair and wearing socks up to my knees and wearing those like... So you're not doing it it right, is what you're saying. Is it a onesie workout outfit? I don't even know how to put it, but you know where you wear the shorts underneath the bathing (laughs) suit. So you're doing it, but you're not doing it right. This is what we're gathering. (laughs) Okay, I I wanted to know the exercise because one of the things that Brittany shares in her episodes is she was a beach body coach. She was very passionate about what she did there with health and fitness and everything else. These are also two really hard episodes to release because a year ago now, actually November 29th was a year since Brittany has passed and gone to be with Jesus. But we are bringing back these episodes for a couple of reasons. One is I just think it's absolutely incredible that Brittany's legacy, the life that she led, the message that she taught again and again from really choosing joy through hardship, the way that her and her husband Reese were so intentional with that in the midst of her battle was absolutely incredible. Like their posts made me laugh and cry at the same time. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I love them. And her messages about, and I have actually one of her t-shirts up in my closet, the living life on purpose, Mm. that she was so intentional with that and all through her battle with cancer. And I just think hers is a story that is worth telling again and again and continuing because people are still just being impacted by her, which isn't that, I mean... I feel like that's what I hope for my own life, that it has that kind of an echo into eternity. And so the other reason we're going to release Britney's as our favorites, because she's absolutely our favorite, but in 2021, we are going to release the episode we just did that is not released yet, but with Reese. We get to sit down with her husband, Reese. Yeah, super powerful. Definitely some tears, but what an incredible guy just absolutely incredible so i'm gonna say this if you don't already follow reese you need to go find him on instagram 
follow his journey, reach out, say hey, look for his episode release. And in terms of these two episodes with Brittany, if you have not already heard them, then you are in for a treat, but also you can still check out her her writings. Reese actually posts a lot about that where mm. she wrote. That's a lot of where she ministered through her writing on Instagram. So you can check that out. And I just really hope these episodes, especially for those who haven't heard before, that this will be yet again one of those times where Brittany's life is going to have an eternal impact and influence in someone's life, especially with everything going on with 2020. I think she has a lot to say about how we live in the midst of hard things and in a way that is faithful in a way that points people to Jesus. So you want to introduce this one? You think you can handle it? Oh, absolutely. It better have energy oh. and fun because Brittany would want all of the above. Should I go get my leotards on? <laughs> she would love it. She would love it. <laughs> but that would scar me for life. So let's just stick with the ugly sweater you're already sporting. That's right. <laughs> well, without further ado, Brittany Crosby. All right, girls, I am here with my kind of newish friend, Brittany Crosby. First time I've seen you face to face, but girlfriend, I am like stalking you on Instagram <laughs> like a creep. So would you like to say hey to the listeners? Hi. <laughs> You're so funny. <laughs> in a in a creepy kind of way, I know. I always like to tell the story. Yours is a little unique. I don't even know if I've shared this with you. You were not a direct, like someone came and said, interview Brittany. What you were was I was somebody on my Instagram, and now I'm going to space on who, tagged your page and was like, if you're not following this girl in her story, then you need to do it now. And I'm calling this like Holy Spirit moment because I see those a lot and I'm such a snob. Like I rarely am like, oh, I'll go jump over there because <laughs> I don't need one more reason to like spend more time on Instagram. But right. <laughs> I just had this like nudge and was like, I'm going to go check out this girl's story and clicked on the link and started reading your story and was in tears like pretty quickly. I mean, I'm a crier. I'm a feeler. But just was so moved and encouraged and blessed by not just your story, but how you have used your platform and social media, your relationships, everything else to just not just share your story, but share really to share about your faith and what God is doing and to bring hope in the midst of something that can otherwise feel very scary. I just, I loved it from the moment that I started following. And so like a creep, I followed and then I immediately reached out and I was like, Hey, so you don't know me at all. (laughs) (laughs) And you were so sweet to write back and you're like, yeah, we totally come on the podcast. So here we are. It's crazy. Here we are. Oh my gosh. And for you to tell me that, like, thank you so much because this, I mean, it's not always easy to share your story, especially when sometimes you're like, I don't want to talk about this anymore. But for you to tell me that just gives me so much purpose into what I'm doing and and into my fight and into the hard parts of my life. So thank you. Hmm. Thank you. Well, I know I am just one voice among many, many, I'm sure that would share very similarly how God's using it. And so The flip side of that is we're going to have a lot of listeners that are like, who is Brittany Crosby? (laughs) Like, who is this girl? I feel honored that we get to sit down and that we get to air this and, and for you to have a voice into that many more lives. And so why don't we just take some time? You can kind of rewind back to the beginning. For sure. I was born in Georgetown, Texas, which is just north of Austin. And I grew up here my entire life. We didn't move around or anything. We had tons of family vacations over the summer. If you look at my Instagram, you see I love adventure. So that's where that all sparked from. I played sports, uh, soccer and volleyball, and I did dance and running. And But I was also super nerdy, as I admitted earlier to you. <laughs> So I did really well in school also, and I went to A&M Corpus Christi. I didn't know 
uh, what I wanted to do. And I remember sitting there, you know, when they pull you in and they sit you at that, that desk with the um, guidance counselor kind of person. I don't yeah. know. That person. Who's that like, person. Yes. <laughs> Chemo brain. <laughs> um, so, and she's asking me like, okay, you know, what do you want to major in? And I was like, deer in the headlights. I have no idea. And all of the women in my family are, are teachers or in the school system somehow, things like that. So she's going through the list and I'm like, okay, well, I mean, education, that's familiar. We'll do education. I can change it later. And I stuck with that. I, I never changed it. I, I mean, I, I liked it. I definitely had a knack for it. So made some of my best friends going to school there. Going to school at the beach was really cool, but for only like six months and then I was ready to be done. <laughs> so I graduated in three and a half years. But during that time, after a few rough years and poor choices and rough relationships, which I know is a common theme among just American women. <laughs> yeah. I started dating Reese, my now husband. We actually met each other in second grade. Super what? cute. <laughs> um, and everyone's like, oh my gosh, you married your elementary sweetheart. But that's only kind of the truth because he didn't know he was my elementary sweetheart. <laughs> <laughs> I actually got busted later when my brother pulled out my, I think it was my fourth or fifth grade yearbook. And there's like hearts around Reese and stuff. It's super embarrassing or cute. I can't decide which one, but. <laughs> well, now that you're married, it's adorable. If he'd right, married someone else, it'd be weird. Each other, it's not creepy, right? Yeah. <laughs> but no, I was that girl on the playground who like played sports with all the boys and ran around the track with all of them. So, you know, we were friends in elementary, middle and high school, but never dated until we were in college. He went to Texas Tech and I went to Corpus. So I really think God has a sense of humor that we live in the same town our entire lives and don't date until we're 13 hours apart. So yeah, that was fun. Yeah. So I started dating Reese at the end of my college career, I guess. I started fitness instructing, which was kind of the little caveat into what I'm doing now. But I graduated in three and a half years, moved to Lubbock to be with Reese after that, and got my first job, not as a teacher, but as an aide. And I made $600 a month in that, by the way, after taxes and retirement and all that. So Reese and I had fun living on very, very small amounts of money. So after that, I got my first big girl teaching job in Lubbock. And, um, I just, at first I, I thought that I was just having a rough time teaching that even though I was good at it, that like, Oh, everyone struggles this much in their first year. Like all of everyone hates it their first year. Like, you know, like I loved my kids, but I, I didn't feel called to teach, I think was the problem. And I had so much guilt with that because you see other teachers and you're like, wow, like, this is your dream job. You're doing such a good job. And, and it's like, I'm putting all, my all into this and it just does not feel right. Mm -hmm. I eventually realized that my guilt wasn't from me not feeling called. My guilt was from me feeling like I was taking somebody else's spot who it was their dream. Wow. And when I realized that, I was like, okay, I've got to do something about this because it's not only affecting me, it's affecting whose spot that I'm in, who should be here. And so I started online fitness coaching on the side because I didn't have time to go back to be an instructor because also instructors make zilch. So <laughs> just yeah. being honest about that and there are bills to be paid. So I couldn't do that. And plus with teaching... I mean, I was at work by like 6.30 in the morning, staying till 6.30 at night. So I didn't have time to do anything else. When I started this on the side, before that, I was super into CrossFit and running half marathons, doing all that for a while. But I also still had a really negative body image, particularly from choices I made in college and just not really like truly taking care of myself. I hated the way I felt in my own skin, didn't have confidence. You know, I'd go shopping and buy all the things and then you go in your closet and you're like, 
I hate this. Like, I don't, you know, I, I don't want to anything. wear. <laughs> yeah, I literally, you're like looking at your like 87 shirts. And you're like, I have nothing to wear. And I hated that. And I knew that God had more for me. Like, that's not how he wanted me to live my life. You know, he didn't want me to hate the body he had given me and to feel so bad about myself and insert my friend Maggie. So I met Maggie two years before this on my honeymoon in Mexico. <laughs> so Reese and I got married a, a, a year and a half after we started dating and we went to Mexico to an all-inclusive resort where we end up meeting our friends, Josh and Maggie, who were there on their first anniversary, who are still our best friends to this day, six years later. That's so fun. So yeah, we, we met, we hung out the whole time, played a ridiculous amount of beach volleyball. Okay. That's and weird. You hung out the whole time. We did. I know. <laughs> it's your honeymoon. <laughs> I know. I'm like, well, oh, well, um, no, but we had a great time. Like Josh is absolutely my husband's best friend and it's yeah, it's incredible. They lived in Alaska at the time. So well, of course they're your best but... friends. You guys honeymoon together. Yeah. <laughs> like, bonded you know, for life. Like, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so two years after this, Maggie, I start seeing her doing this like fitness stuff. And I'm like, man, I am like crossfitting and running for hours a day. Like, why don't I feel as happy as she is? Like, why why am I not seeing results like she is? And she was like, well, girl, you should just be a coach with me. And I was like, mm, nah, <laughs> I'm not about that. <laughs> and so for a few months, she just kept saying like, okay, I know you'd love it. Like, I know you'd love it. And finally my husband was like, okay, either do it or stop talking about it. Like, and so I was like, okay, I literally have nothing to lose. Let's go for it. So I started doing that on the side and I, I mean, you know this, but I'll just say this for all the listeners that I partnered with a company called Beachbody and did that on the side while teaching. And it actually made me so pumped to wake up at 4.45 in the morning, which I didn't think was a thing. I'm like, but no, that's the middle of the night. <laughs> but I would get up, I would get some of my work done for coaching. I would do my workout and then go to work um, at school. That's it made a commitment. Me it, you know, sometimes I look back and I'm like, okay, 6.30 feels super early now. And then I even get to stay home all day. Like, how did I do 4.45? But no, it was so worth it because it made me a better wife, a better friend, a better daughter, a better teacher. And about 14 or 15 months after I started, I was able to put my resignation in for teaching. I stayed the entire school year. I didn't leave till the summer. Um, I didn't want to do that to my kiddos. But it, it just had eventually come a time where it just made more sense for me to spend all of my time coaching. And there was so much fulfillment in that, that I didn't meet, miss that fulfillment piece from teaching. And I also was like, okay, now somebody who teaching is their dream. Now they can go do their dream because I'm following mine. And to quit teaching did not make sense in my mind at all. I was like, oh my gosh, people are going to think I'm crazy. My parents are like what are you doing? <laughs> like you're working online. Like how, what is all this? You know, they supported me, but it was just like a, a weird thing for people to think that like, I went to school for all that time to go do this. And now I'm like, all right, bye. <laughs> like, but I felt God's nudge. It was just like, this is not going to make sense, but I need you to do it. I remember standing at my principal's door and I was like, no, I can't knock. No, you know, it's like that scene in frozen where they're like, does she even know how to knock? Yes. <laughs> yes. Just knock. So I did. I, I put my resignation in. It was hard, but it. I just remember going for it and feeling that total peace that comes when you're, you're obedient, mm -hmm. even when it doesn't make sense. And it was literally the most scary and liberating thing I have ever done. I knew that it was God's purpose for me to do that, but I, I thought... It was for me to like be a stay at home mom or go full time travel or something like that. Little did I know what he had in store for me, which unfortunately is not as fun as what I thought it was going to be. Just being real there. But four months later, after that, I started not feeling well. 
Reese and I had gone on a little weekend getaway and I had like one glass of wine, one beer with him, and then like a piece of pizza. I woke up the next day feeling like I had like quadruple that. Hmm. And I'm like, what is wrong? I guess like I am just not used to this anymore. Like my stomach doesn't handle this. I ate super healthy before. So I'm like, all right, it's the pizza, you know, I just don't feel well. I'll feel better tomorrow. Well, then day after day, it didn't get better, kept getting worse. And I'm like, this isn't, you know, a pizza hangover. This something's not right. Mm. So I started going to the doctor and I'm just like, something is wrong. Something is wrong. And they could not figure it out. They scanned my gallbladder. They told me um, that I needed to cut out dairy. So I did felt better for maybe a week. And then they're like, okay, well, maybe also cut out gluten. So I went gluten free, started feeling a little better Then it would come. But every time I would cut something out it would come back. And I'm like, okay, like that helps, but we're just putting band-aids on a bigger issue here. I went to several doctors, one of which sent me to the hospital in an ambulance thinking that I had a blood clot in my lung or maybe having a heart attack. (laughs) And yeah, it was just all this crazy stuff. And so many, so many doctors told me that I was crazy. One literally told me, sweetheart, this is all in your head you need to take the Xanax I prescribed to you, please. And I'm like, I am not crazy. I know something is wrong. I know something is wrong and I need somebody to care enough to figure this out. So that was like the beginning of September all the way through Thanksgiving. And eventually when I got to Thanksgiving, I couldn't even eat. I was so bloated and feeling full and just having crazy stomach pain, just so tired. I took my own plate of food to my grandma's house because all I could eat was plain chicken and sweet potatoes. It was so sad. I'm like, how did it get to that point? Then the next week I spent four out of the five days in the ER, sent home every time saying there's nothing wrong with you. And the last time I was finally like, I am not going home. I refuse to leave this hospital until you figure out what's wrong with me. And so I made them give me a room. My husband said this, you know, they kind of rolled their eyes at me. And my husband was like, no, she's not leaving. And when they still tried to push us out, my dad was there and he was like, no, we're really not leaving. <laughs> I go, we're staying here. Good so I got, you. I got a room and cause I'm like, I'm, you're sending me home every night and every night I come back. And I mean, I'm not, you know, a sissy. I tolerate a lot of pain and this is not okay. They finally gave me a room. And then this is kind of where the two weeks of my life that I don't remember comes in. I was on a lot of pain meds, a lot of nausea meds, all very, very fuzzy. But I knew that they were starting to run tests a lot faster. I was hooked up to, like, I couldn't eat. I couldn't even hold water down. So I was hooked up to all sorts of different monitors and machines and feeding me through an IV and a tube, like, up my nose. It was not fun. Finally, uh, about after... Like two weeks uh, after more tests and tests and tests were all run and all of them were stat. And while you do want to find out results really fast, you don't want to have to be a stat everything in a hospital. We knew that it was not going to be good, but never once did I see this coming. Never once. Because I had been constantly told over and over, you have nothing life-threatening. You have nothing life-threatening. You're fine. You have nothing life-threatening. And so I thought it was going to be something like celiacs or they thought it maybe was like bacteria I had picked up from hiking in Colorado. They thought just a couple other different things. It was like, okay, that'll, that'll be really hard, but it'll be fine. The third gastro doctor that I was seeing, because that's what all my symptoms were, 110% GI. He came in the room and he was like, he said, is all your family here? And I was like, um, I don't think so. Um, and my mother-in-law started to call all of them getting my husband, of course, had left that one day (laughs) to go to work. So he came back, my dad came, his work is right across the street from the hospital. And so they all get there and they're not in my room for a while. And I'm like, okay, I guess maybe they're not all here yet. I'm talking to my sister-in-law, my husband's sister, and we're just kind of lightheartedly chatting. And then all of a sudden, 
my doctor walks in and everyone's filing in behind him and I'm searching their faces. Like, why won't anybody look at me? Like nobody is making eye contact with me. So they all come quietly, sit around the room and my doctor's on one side and my husband's on the other, you know, they're both holding my hands and I'm like, all right, brace yourself, girlfriend. Something is about to happen. <laughs> like, I, and so he sat me down and he said, sweetheart, I'm really just sorry to tell you this, but you have cancer. And it was the weirdest thing. I mean, you would think that I would just collapse into a puddle and that it would just be devastation. But I think at that point I was so, so sick that it was almost relief that it was like, okay, now we know what to fight. Like now we know what to do. You know, what do we do about this now? Yeah. Um, and so we said, well, you know, we're getting a game plan together and we'll have that for you in the next day. And so he escorted my whole family out besides my husband and Reese laid there in the bed with me and we blasted Lauren Daigle's trust in you. Yes. So loud. probably disturbed the people next door, but it's like, nope, this is what I need. And it's now tattooed on my arm, by the way, if you didn't see we played that and there was just this like, okay, now we know, I know what to fight. And it was in that moment that I then realized why God had had me quit my teaching job. And it was just like, okay, you were setting me up to be able to go to all of these doctor's appointments and to not have to ask off of work and to be laying here in the stupid hospital bed, but not having to worry about anything other than the task at hand, which was fighting for my life. And after that, like I couldn't be around crowds during chemo, feeling like junk throughout that. Like I could do that from my own couch and not have to write sub plans or worry about what was happening with that. And I mean, honestly, my job now as a fitness coach, I love it. Like, and it, it's such people are like, why do you keep working throughout treatment and all this? Like, why don't you just stop? And I'm like, okay, treatment and cancer and all the symptoms and side effects are crappy. Doing something that gives you purpose is such a fun distraction. Mm. Like I need that. And so I keep doing that, but got diagnosed, started chemo or sorry, had surgery 24 hours later and started chemo five days later. Lost all my hair, of course. Thankfully, growing back now. <laughs> it's adorable. I like the Thank pixie you. on you. You know, I would have never cut my hair like this had it not been for this. And I actually don't hate it. I don't think I'll go back super long, but... <laughs> I, I think I'll, I think I'll I think go to rock it. You, you rock the pixie. I'm just saying. <laughs> oh, thank you. Pixie don't girls got to stick together. <laughs> yeah. I know I'm half tempted to keep it. So maybe like listeners can vote on that or something. I don't know, but <laughs> that'd be so fun. We totally need to put a poll like yeah. your old picture with long hair and then you with the pixie. Oh, yes. We totally need to do that. Oh my gosh. That would be so fun. <laughs> but yeah, anyways, so lost all my hair, lost all my muscles, came home from the hospital weighing a rock solid 99 pounds. But you know, from day one of diagnosis, I was so determined to not let this steal my joy. I'm like, cancer might take my ability to have kids. It might take my muscles. It might take my hair, but this will not steal my joy at all. Like I still have life to live. This is just a little part of it, you know? And by little, I mean a lot, but <laughs> we're going to put it back where it came from. And actually it was funny. My oncologist told me, he's like, well, you know, I know you're a fitness coach, but you're going to struggle to put muscle back on. Like, just know that. And I'm like, okay, watch me. <laughs> Obviously, yes. you don't know me. Challenge accepted. <laughs> so I knew we were meant yeah. to be good friends. <laughs> I'm like, oh, just tell me I can't do something and I will do it. So <laughs> I'm putting muscle on so hard and then I'm coming yeah. back and flexing for you. <laughs> uh, yes. That's actually funny. Like at one of my scans, he was like, man, I don't think I've ever had a patient this in shape. <laughs> that line of my scan, it, we had a good laugh about that. But yeah, I got cleared to work out, you know, about two months after my surgery and just really haven't stopped since. Like I, that's what kept me going through all that is it was just blasting worship music and doing my workout, even if I felt like junk. <laughs> So I went through chemo, weekly chemo for 24 straight weeks. Don't recommend that. It's definitely like by far the most like 
my least favorite thing I've ever done in my life. But I, after 24 weeks, I was declared NED, which means no evidence of disease. And we celebrated huge, had a huge party because the entire way through chemo, I kept telling my parents, and my husband, I was like, I want a big party. I want there to be confetti, champagne, and a dance floor. Yes. And they brought it. Oh my gosh. There were so many people. We all had these huge confetti poppers, as much champagne as I wanted. Like we all danced all night. It was so fun. Kind of felt like another like wedding reception. So we celebrated. And then three weeks later, started not feeling good. And I was like, hmm. So I, you know, I had graduated to like three month appointments and I texted my nurse um, who's become like a, you know, like a third mom to me, you know, I have my mom, my mother-in-law, and then, you know, I have my nurse, Tina. And I was just like, you know, I really don't feel good. Something's wrong. Something's up. And I went in, they did the CA-125 blood test on me and it had doubled. And I was like, okay. Which didn't mean that it was back, but it meant that it probably was. And so we were like, you know what, just continue enjoying life for another month. And we're going to test it again. Cause there's nothing on your CT. There's nothing on your pet. Like, let's just see. So then another three weeks goes by, test it again and it doubled again. And we were like, okay, we don't really like the way this is headed. We'll do another CT. And that's when we saw increased fluid and, you know, a couple other things that my oncologist didn't really like. So he, at that point was like, you know what? I think you need to go to MD Anderson. And never in a million years do you ever think that, you know, yourself is going to have to go to the top cancer center in the nation. You know, yeah. you never, like, you hear about it and you're like, man, MD Anderson, oh, that must suck to go there. And then all of a sudden, your name is a patient there. And that's, ugh, it's rough. But also knowing that they are, you know, one of the best at what they do also reassured me. So we headed there. My doctor there just continued monitoring me, eventually put me on like a hormone blocker pill that caused crazy bad joint pain and all of this and only worked for about a month. So then switched to another treatment, tried another chemo. And after about three or four months, found out that was not working. Then I'm chemo resistant, which means that chemo can, you know, buy any time, but it's not likely to be curative ever. And so now kind of brings me to today, I am on a clinical trial for immunotherapy, MD Anderson. So just finished dose number two and found out that my number is stable for the first time since I quit chemo. So we're going to take that as a win and just roll yeah. forward with it. But yeah, I just, and throughout all these treatments, it's been a long fight so far. I mean, I know there are many others that have been in this longer than I have, but it's been quite a rough road but throughout it I'm like my husband <laughs> he's made this like going to treatment almost a fun adventure like we'll play you know our like 90s jams in the car on the way there because it's it before it was a 45 minute drive and now it's a three and a half hour drive wow so we just make the most of it we end up like taking silly pictures every week racing down the hallway on a rolly chair <laughs> just like all sorts of fun stuff so yeah it's just it's been a long road but we're trying to make the most of it even if we have to spend a lot of time at the hospital so what is your official diagnosis my official diagnosis is stage 3c ovarian cancer and if you want to, if listeners want to get more specific, it's high and low grade serous ovarian cancer, which means I kind of have two types, which makes me even more rare. So it's a, no, it's not a normal kind, but like a more prevalent kind in ovarian cancer. But one, I was diagnosed at 27. Most are diagnosed a lot older and most have high or low. And I have both, which is why it's being really stubborn. So I gotcha. Yeah. So one of the things, the questions that come to mind is you're describing this journey of, um, from when you first found out and then you do treatment and those mm -hmm. weeks, the mm -hmm. weeks of, okay, I don't feel good. 
And, and it's funny because when you, when you talk about the story, it's easy to kind of walk through like, and then they said, come back in three, but I'm just like putting myself in three weeks is Mm -hmm. it's fast, but then it's not right. What did those weeks of waiting look like for you? Like, how do you walk through those days when you're, you don't have answers yet, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm going to have scans, but it's not. Cause I'll be real. I'm such an impatient person. Like when I know something's up, I'm like, no, like let's today, let's <laughs> for just, sure. Just, I want to know what I'm dealing with here. And to have, you know, to have them look at you and be like, okay, we'll let you know in a month. And mm-hmm. I know that there is this thing called hospital time that exists mm-hmm. that is like no other time. And like real talk, it's awful. It's awful yeah. when you're at the hospital and you're even when you're a stat, like yeah. is sometimes stat is like in eight hours later, like, yes. It's just... And things kind of move in slow motion. It's like, Whoa. yes. <laughs> Scanxiety is a real thing. It's just constant. Just, I mean, there, there is not a day go that goes by that I have longer than 10 minutes without thinking about this. Hmm. My my team retreat in Park City this past weekend, and then when my husband and I like go hiking, those have been the only times where I can go extended periods of time without thinking about this. And so those weeks of waiting in between, oh my gosh, I just, it's hard. And then it also becomes this like really sweet time with Jesus too, because I, I just sit there and I'm like, I can't get through this. They're like, how am I going to make it to the next appointment? Or how am I going to, like, am I going to get sick between now and the next appointment? Am I going to wake up in the middle of the night in pain again? Like, what is the next scan going to say? Is my blood draw going to be okay? And it's just, it's taught me to cling to Jesus because there's literally nothing else you can do. No amount of worry, no amount of even doing anything, no amount of workout, no amount of whatever is going to take it away or make it any better or change anything, Mm -hmm. but God can. What does clinging to Jesus look like for you? Like just um, practically speaking. Yeah. Yeah. Put it because I know me before it was like, oh yeah, I cling to Jesus. Like pray a couple times. I don't know. And for it to, for me to really like put practical things into place every day has made a huge difference. So wake up in the morning. First thing I do Bible study, like Mm. I read Jesus calling every morning, whatever Bible study I have to be doing at the time and just really read his word. And throughout the day, you know, spend, and then that morning, you know, spend time in prayer. And sometimes that means just sitting in silence and just listening and, calming my own thoughts about everything and honestly like praying about others too like not just focusing on myself but to have this like list I have a list in my phone of like these other prayer things and it's like that helps me get my mind off of myself because going through this it'd be so easy to be just like all right heal me okay give me the strength for today all this and all about me But that also gives myself a little bit of anxiety, like thinking about that all the time. So to get my brain off of that, but to still be in communication with the Lord is so, I feel like so important. And then throughout the day, I listen to podcasts and to like church sermons and worship music and all of that. And just reminding myself to pray a whole lot more often. Whereas before it was just like, okay, do my five minute devotional in the morning and then, all right, good for the day. Hmm. And just to be filling my brain with more of that and keep my focus on that has really made a huge, huge difference. Hmm. I'm not going to lie. I'm not immune to panic attacks and to feeling anxious and to all of that. But I think bringing those honest feelings to God and telling him, this is what I'm feeling in this moment. And I can't do this. I think that being honest like that and really being open about it gives God the way to your heart to change that. But it's actually funny that you asked that question about the whole like three week waiting thing. I was talking to 
uh, my husband and I were just recently talking about this, that now that I'm in like monthly treatments versus weekly, it's harder. Like granted, I feel better physically. Like the weekly treatments, I was like, I was knocked on my rear for (laughs) six months solid. And so I didn't feel well at all during that whole time, but it felt like I was like doing something, you know? I'm like, all right, if I can just make it through these 24 weeks, like I can do this. I feel like junk, but it's okay. Like that means it's working. And for me to go to monthly treatments, like I have been since last fall, I'm like, all right, we're not doing enough. <laughs> like, And that's really made me rely more on God than on medical treatments. Wow. And put my faith in the right thing. You know, not saying sit back, twiddle my thumbs and just hope it's going to go away. I mean, you've got to do the treatments, but just to, to really think in perspective of that, of like, okay, I can't put all my trust into this treatment. I've got to put all my trust into God using this treatment. And that's been a really big difference. Man, I think that that truth alone, you could, you could spiritually gut check a lot of people (laughs) in many arenas of life, as far as that angst we have to feel Mm -hmm. like we need to do Someone said this and it wasn't original to them, but I wrote it down the other day and I've been repeating it in my mind again and again is this idea of, do we really believe that the work that God does in us is just as important as the work he does through us? And just that idea of, of being with God, that trusting in God and Mm -hmm. not always having to be in the position of doing, doing, doing. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, I mean, it was that kind of conviction that you're like, oh, I wish I'd shut my ears right before they said that. (laughs) No, I did not hear that. (laughs) It's, oh, it's painful, but it's so true and so not natural. No. And I I think one of the big realizations that helped me come to that kind of aha moment was realizing that like, the stuff is not just happening to you. It can happen for you, even if it looks really crappy from the outside. Yeah. You know, that he's going to bring you through this, but you do have to go through this. Absolutely. One of the things you said earlier, it's interesting. It brought up this conversation. What you said was really wise. The conversation it brought up in my brain was super shallow, but they do connect. (laughs) I'm totally down for that. (laughs) (laughs) But you were talking about just describing to your friends who were like, why would you still do this coaching thing? And you're like, you know, when you are battling things like cancer, you're going through these things like doing something with purpose, like that's such a great distraction. And I, a friend of mine was Voxing. I don't know if you use Voxer. If you I haven't, but I've heard I should. So you I might should. download it. I'm Girl, it <laughs> we can be real life friends on Voxer. Okay. Let's do it. <laughs> so my friend was Voxing me and in the middle of the conversation, like her talking, she's like, she kind of paused for like a, a long moment and she's like, Oh, I'm so sorry. I just got distracted driving. And I was laughing and I messaged her back and I was like, I think it's funny that you see driving as the distraction and you messaging me as the priority. I was like, <laughs> because I think what actually happened there was you were distracted from what you should have been focused on. But I was thinking as you're saying that I'm like, how, how much the enemy loves to, whether it's cancer or other things is the purpose, what God has designed us for the things that he puts in front of us being the focus. And he loves to distract us Mm -hmm. with things that can very easily, we shift that. What is the thing that we're actually supposed to be doing? And what is the distraction here? And sometimes something as big, and I don't mean to like downplay cancer whatsoever, like don't hear me wrong, but something that massive that easily Mm -hmm. you could be like, girl, this is all you can focus on. Like you, you're fighting for your life and nobody would argue that that's a legitimate like life focus Right. for you to turn that on its head and be like, actually, this is not my focus. I'm going to focus on my purpose and not allow this to become a distraction. Like we're going to shift this back around, you know, like for her, yeah. let's, let's drive and then maybe message <laughs> later. Like, <laughs> but yeah, for you to just continue on. And I just think that's, it's one of the things that drew me to your story is your story. It doesn't align from human, like 
you know, perspective as far as what you would think. <laughs> now that listeners have heard your words, they need to go find you on Instagram <laughs> and just honestly comment like, okay, I look at you and I don't think this woman has been fighting for her life. She's been in this really long. That's not to say that, like, obviously this is hard and yeah. you face hard days and you're not being inauthentic on your Instagram, but what you've managed to do is flip this thing around and be like, mm-hmm. you know what? Cancer could easily distract you from what God has placed me here to do. And mm-hmm. cancer is a part of my story, but it's not my whole story. Exactly. Like there is more to me. And that is everything I love about your Instagram and who you are is your <laughs> life screams that like Thank that you. God is bigger than everything that I'm going through right now. Yes. So. Yeah. No. And I, I love that. I think that's been something that I've been, you know, pretty intentional about, um, was just not giving cancer more power than it's already trying to have, you mm-hmm. know? And if I made that my focus and that just my number one thing, cause it tries real dang hard to be my number one thing yeah. every single day. Like I said, there's, there most days I don't go longer than five minutes thinking without thinking about it, but why give it more than it deserves? We're going to make our focus something else yeah, and not forget that there is a bigger, a bigger purpose than just me surviving cancer. I really want to outlive it even while I have it, Mm -hmm. you know? Well, I I'm emotionally say, even as I say this, but I applaud you because you're doing that. Thank you. You're doing Thank it. You. And it's powerful for, for someone who's not even battling cancer, but just everyday life to we be, you know. <laughs> and that's it. It's true. Everybody has stuff. So even for mm-hmm. listeners, like this doesn't have cancer doesn't have to be your thing, but I guarantee you, we have an enemy that has a whole tool chest full of things he would love to become bigger than what God has called us, the race he's placed in front of us. And I just think I love coming across people that you're like, Oh, I love it when God's winning. Like there's just something about it that inspires you to be like, that's, I want my life to be one that people look and be like, God won. Like he just won in that life there. It was a battle and it was sometimes a bloodbath but he Mm -hmm. still won. (laughs) Yes. And he will win every time. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Well, man, I, we could talk forever, but I obviously, my, my producer will give me the, um, (laughs) really need to watch the clock, babe. You get a little carried away. Yeah. He calls me babe because he's married to me. I'm not, I'm not inappropriately close to my producer. Like it's fine. It's okay. It's fine. It's totally normal. <laughs> oh my god. I do have one more question for you. Yeah, for sure. It's important, I feel like I just yes. need to know this. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm sitting here just enthralled by gosh, I love you and so many things about your life are amazing. But but what I really need to know is what is the most superficial thing about you? So you're gonna laugh at my answer because it doesn't apply today literally but the most superficial thing about me is that I am obsessed with my false eyelashes I don't have any on today because I rubbed them off yesterday it was about time for those puppies to go but I started doing them when I came home from the hospital actually and I think they're like losing my hair and going bald and feeling a little bit like you know a 12 year old boy or as my hair grows out I feel a little bit like like Justin Bieber a little bit. (laughs) So for me to have on like girly eyelashes, I'm like, okay, still a 28 year old female. It's all good. And for the days that I don't feel like putting on makeup, I can still feel girly. So yes. Do you do the legit extensions where they like attach them? Oh yeah. I get trusted with like eyelashes and and, like glue and sticky stuff around my eyeballs that would not end well. I don't need another ER visit. So I have my friend um, who has a salon do them. (laughs) I've had them done once and I loved them. My one thing with them and I have, I really need to get over it is I am a rub my eyes Mm. like to a fault and you can't like rub your eyes with that. Like, no. 
it's that will literally murder your eyeballs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, seriously. And I felt like I kept like going to do it and was, Oh no, don't touch my yeah. eyes. And so by the time they were, it was ready for them to come off. I was kind of ready for like, I wanted yeah. the look of them, yeah. but I could no longer handle the feel of like, I just once wanted to be able to sleepy <laughs> rub my eyes like a yeah. child. And <laughs> I wonder if I should just take a day break from them and be like a baby all day and rub my eyes. And then the next day go put them back on. <laughs> right. I know that was one thing I had to get used to also, but yeah, there's something to be said about waking up and being like, bam, there they are. Like, I woke up like this, you know, <laughs> seriously, seriously, maybe you're born with it. Maybe it's Maybelline or, <laughs> or false eyelashes. Yeah. We don't, we- no, there's no way to tell, but now everybody knows my secrets. So now they do know. We're no, we're known for outing people on their, uh, 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 their beauty secrets. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, gosh, this has been such a gift. Brittany, you are, you're a special person. I'm sure that you hear that a lot. You better hear that a lot. It sounds like your husband is kind of amazing. And so uh, I'm, beyond amazing, like, I'm assuming if he you think I'm that. cool, I mean, eh. He's really cool. So oh, maybe yeah. he should be my next interview. We need another oh dude on the podcast. <laughs> we should totally do that. <laughs> Fuck <them> a little bit. <laughs> that would be amazing. Uh, well, thank you so much for coming on. I look forward to continuing to stalk you like a creep. But girl, if you get Voxer, it doesn't have to be stalked. We can like we can have small conversations throughout the it's day. Ha- I'm, I'm going to download it once I get off here. So. <laughs> well, thank you so much. And we'll talk soon. Okay. Thank you so much. I enjoyed this.